a concentrated global fund. And um, we go where there's, there's deep pessimism, um, in it, structural inefficiencies, and um, just like all of you, we're, we're seeking to optimize the risk-adjusted return profile. And I, and I would really advocate, so that Spain is a relatively young country in value investing, and, and perhaps New York isn't. And what happens over time is you start to look at qualitative factors, as we have and as, as I'm sure you do. 95% um, of my peers in New York only look at quality, and they get wrapped up into 3% cash flow yields because the management and the business and everything is just so fantastic, and that's when you have 80 to 90% drawdowns. So I'd like to impress upon you, uh, what we do is we, we, we think quality, we, we try to optimize qualitative success factors. It, we, we, we're sort of, I'll, I'll go through the process, but um, I'd really like to impress upon you, don't get too enamored with quality to where price you don't pay attention to anymore. So we have like a quantum mechanics framework, and I, I don't have time to talk about the framework, but on, on the left side, you'll see where we are in the stage as we go through our, our idea today. Um, so we basically just, we're, we're sort of a post-catalyst investor. We don't believe that events that I tell you about can dr actually drive the value. It's the management teams, it's, it's how the businesses behave to their communities, it's, it's, it's all of the qualitative factors. That drives the return. But we always want to make sure that we're, we're minimizing risk and, and optimizing return, of course. Um, I'm all about accountability, so here's what I told you last year. Um, if you would have shorted VW uh, and gone long XOR or Fiat, either, either or, you would have produced a, a fairly interesting risk-free return. We actually still like VW right now. Um, you've got, the pressure is just continuously building and the market's fairly oblivious to it. Um, most notably, China's weakening, Elon Musk is on time, and a founding uh, controlling family is actually dumping their position. Um, you have, uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm setting the stage from yes from last year because I'm, I'm basically inverting the whole trade for you this year. You have a business that is, has imposed a $16 billion externality by foregoing actual emissions controls. And um, this uh, regulator right here uh, just basically changed the law so that they were compliant, even though that's your health that's on the line. Um, and then if you look at the, uh, if you look at the goal setting, um, there's one, one management team is fairly underwhelming and one is actually producing fantastic results. The inversion of that is this gentleman, John Mackey at Whole, he's the CEO of Whole Foods, and uh, this is one of the books I'd like to recommend that you read. And it, and it is not environmentalism and protecting the world and you know hippy-dippy stuff. It is literally a, the best defense of capitalism I've read in a long time. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about Whole Foods, which is, we think, very contrarian. Um, and, and I'd like to talk about the retail um, so the process here on the left, that's, where, that's what stage we are. Step one is always abstract thinking. I've been trying to go long Italy forever, right? So I've been thinking about retail and distribution. I really enjoyed Gary's presentation last year about Sports Direct as well. But if you think about retail, it is just distribution. So you want to lower your costs. You want high traffic. You want non-commodity goods. You want high customer satisfaction. You want low capital intensity. So all of the innovation in retail has happened on lowering SG&A, lowering costs. Um, and what I'd posit to you is that no innovation has happened on mix. Um, and Whole Foods has been very slowly but surely moving up the value chain on, uh, on margin mix. Um, bar, they're literally installing bars into their, um, into their grocery stores, which gross margin-wise about 50% profit margins. Um, so this is where, the, in the abstract thinking, this is where I started the process of wanting to go along this trend of food halls um, and basically converged grocery stores. Um, Italy is going to IPO this year. It's probably going to price above 20 times EBITDA. No surprise, we're priced out. But you can get a fast follower. Here's uh, Whole Foods' newest location in Bryant Park, New York. Um, it is a completely, and actually it's even more automated than, than Italy, so margins will be higher. Um, this is some people just enjoying drink, drinks and food. Um, the margin opportunity is massive. Italy's New York location is a 20% margin store. Um, nation, or globally, Italy is at 7.5%, probably because they're building out so, so much right now. So we, we like the trend. We like what's going on. Step two of the process is always, what is my downside? So uh, grocery in the UK, uh, US, has been stuck in deflation. Deflation two weeks ago 
we got the, I mean, all the executives were telling us this, but two weeks ago, we actually got government confirmation that deflation is ebbing. Um, a lot of investors talk about the threat of Aldi and Little. First of all, totally different market, but they're already here. They're almost at the same scale of our biggest grocery store, um, Kroger. Uh, in, in, in 18 months, they'll basically be there. Um, and here's, here's probably one of the more important charts because it's almost half the market where people actually care about the food that they put in their body. Ironically, um, a generics pharmaceutical company said people usually care about more what they put on their face instead of inside their body, which is sort of counterintuitive. But, uh, but now more and more people are waking up, and, you, and it's a very limited uh, segment of the market that actually is appealing to these sort of foodie trend-setting uh, customers. Whole Foods' penetration is 1%. Um, and so what's interesting is like everyone thinks that, hey, organic's going everywhere in America. Europeans don't even know what organic means because everything you eat is organic. But here, <laughs> we, we basically, uh, we, we mass produce and, and we, we're, in, we're into factory food. 70% um, of the, the items that Whole Food actually sold weren't organic. So just the fact that your local Kroger has organic, it doesn't actually mean that much. But what it does mean is people no longer drive two hours to a Whole Foods, now they can actually get there. If they really care about organic, they can actually get it more locally. So that's gone. The quality is very different. The cheapest eggs you can get, this, I mean, this, is, this, this, this speaks for itself. And Kroger says, by 2025, we're going to get to the left-hand side. So good luck. But isn't retail dead? So Bezos is famous for this quote, uh, your margin is my opportunity. Um, ironically, Amazon isn't actually that low margin because what we'll talk about, um, the distribution. So here's the zone of disruption that we'd like to think about. Um, as a retailer, you want to maximize your turnover, lower your, your capital intensity, and have as, be as best margins as you possibly can. Where Amazon can go after easiest is high margin, low turnover businesses. And so some of the red here already bankrupt, gone, liquidated. Um, but everyone around Amazon right here is at risk of being disrupted. And you actually can see um, Signet Jewelers right here, Blue Nile, totally disrupting the same exact business uh, and, and being able to save, save the customer quite a bit. Um, Whole Foods, obviously, at the highest end of the spectrum. Aldi UK is a, it's a turnover is so much higher in UK stock, um, markets because, uh, than, than the US because you're dealing with London so much. Um, so it's not actually a great comp. But, Aldi is Aldi and it's going to succeed no matter what. If you take Amazon's cost structure and try to deliver every bag of groceries, you're talking around 23 bucks per bag of groceries for their distribution chain. And that's the most efficient chain in, in the world. Um, if you look at Ocado, which we actually are studying as a long, um, but Ocado spends 20, 20 pounds to fulfill your order. All in, you're talking 28 pounds. Um, but their order is 100, on average is 108 pounds. Whole Foods, slightly different at 41 bucks, um, and their cost to deliver that bag of groceries to you is 70% lower than Okada's. So if you look at the distribution economics, you trade people in place when you go online, but you trade it for a very inefficient distribution system, and that's all variable. So you have no fixed cost, uh, very little fixed cost leveraging. Um, and so actually you can see Whole Foods' um, cost structure is not very dissimilar to actually already where Amazon is. Interestingly, um, if you look at the spread of baskets, more people go to Whole Foods for their dinner that night than they actually do to stock up on groceries. So really only about five, we don't think that actually um, online works from a cost perspective unless the basket's under 90 bucks. And so as you can see, it's less than 5% of Whole Foods' transactions is, is ripe for disruption, disruption. And that's actually using UK density 3x uh, the US, um, and actually density, density matters, but we're, one of our investors owns a small online grocer, so we have financials to someone who delivers in New York. It's still over $20 in order to de deliver that to their customers. Um, now, I'm not saying it's not gonna work. In fact, we're looking at Ocado potentially as a long, um, but all I'm saying is that it's for high-end and convenience customers. Whole Foods owns these customers' relationships right now. So Ocado is looking for a US partner. Um, they've acknowledged this. You, 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 Whole Foods basically is, is most poised to actually go online. They're already there. So in key cities, they have a partnership with Instacart. They're already seeing high single digit penetration of online customers. Again, Instacart's unprofitable. Not sure that model is going to work for them long term, but investors keep putting money into it. Um, but 
they're going to Whole Foods when they want to shop online. They're not actually going to Amazon Fresh. So Whole Foods is going further because they're centralizing their point of sale system and it's, spe it's, it's saving costs, it's lowering inventory, but it's specifically to go on online commerce. Um, so we already talked about the cost structures, how um, Whole Foods is not too dissimilar from Amazon. Um, again, no one really focuses on the mix of, uh, of Whole Foods. That's their Bryant Park location. Their mix is overwhelmingly skewed to business that has five times the EBITDA margin of typical grocery stores. So this is literally the no profit zone. Almost no one makes money on non-perishables. Um, and what's interesting is like as, as the sustainability of food production gets worse and worse, think of uh, what, how um, Harari says in Sapiens and Homo Deus, um, we're just manufacturing our, 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 our beef and, and meat. Um, as that becomes more and more important, people, the, the number one thing consumers co correlate um, Whole Foods is, is to quality. And also, they have exclusives on all of these, um, these, these vendors. So they don't save much when there's deflation, but they don't actually have met much inflation. And you can't get the product that you're getting there anywhere else. Um, which is really interesting because you, t you start talking about pricing power in a commodity retail. People are willing on average to pay 15% more for a commodity if they just know it's locally sourced or sustainable. Um, and so H Whole Foods is harnessing some of that. So the perception that everyone jokes around in, in America that we, we call uh, Whole Foods whole paycheck, um, the reality is actually adjusting for quality, organic to organic, they're actually cheaper to uh, all the legacies. Um, and so right now, but they've used this deflationary downturn very well. They've had a lot of science projects going on. Um, and so now they're, they're rolling out automated in a very large way um, in, the, in the future. And it's so interesting, Americans, you know, we're, we have these guilty consciences on what we're eating, I'm sure everyone else does, but when they take the person away from the pizza and the cookie jar, like in terms of the guy selling you pizza, consumption doubles. So they're taking the people out Consumption's going up when, they, when they're doing this correctly, and they're taking, they, they have an opportunity to save 15 to 30% on their staffing. Um, look at, I just thought the Europeans would find that funny how an American interpreted Michelangelo. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so Whole Foods will continue to uh, roll out its food hall concept and focus, continue to focus on prep foods, which as you can see has a significantly different margin than the grocery space. Um, their back room is going away. They're lowering their inventory because they're doing um, order to shelf inventory system right now. So most of that back room is going away. They're making room for food hall um, and they're also gonna increase their inventory turnover. Here is what the next 1,000 stores are gonna look like for Whole Foods. Um, and notice the, uh, the high end customer in the parking lot. Um, so all, this does everything that they need, actually. It lowers their capital intensity. It makes their prices equal to Trader Joe's, which is owned by Aldi, which is, it is the benchmark setter. Um, and they're dramatically lowering sg and it's, it's higher return on capital, higher price per square foot, everything that a CEO like this thinks about when he thinks about return on invested capital. There's a couple issues that they have that uh, on their net promoter score, so they don't have the highest net promoter score in the business, Trader Joe's does. They're working on addressing these right now. So it's basically value for money, they don't have these deals in the, in the rewards cards. That's rolling out. So the margin opportunity is very significant as you transition this whole base, right? So um, if, I, if I just assume 30% of their base goes more to whole, um, the food halls, you've got a 2.5% uplift, you have a lot of admin and distribution costs that get scaled as the store base grows, and then you also, in our base case, we assume 8% um, of the employees can be uh, basically automated. Um, again, it's half the market, look at the store counts. There's it's a very underpenetrated market, and yes, all of these guys can have organic and, and try to differentiate themselves somehow. Um, we'll see. So you're buying, Whole Foods is very contrarian right now. You're buying it at trough multiple. Um, you're, if you have any multiple expansion, which we don't assume, we, we like trough multiple, fine, we can still get over our holding period, tw mid 20% Kagers, um, assuming fairly, uh, reasonable assumptions. If, you, if it just goes back to the average multiple that it's traded at, it's, it, it's, it's fairly dramatic Hager. So again, we're post-catalyst, so we kind of think about the range of outcomes. Um, I've defined for you what, what goes into all of our scenarios, but we think it's basically significantly skewed to the upside. Um, the performance drivers, again, this is kind of how we rate management industry, et cetera, um, and, and we're, we're constantly trying to optimize these success factors. Um, and so we think about a roadmap, right? We think about what's gonna happen over the next three, six, 12 months. Um, so deflation's over. 
Uh, they're going to have more science project findings from what they're doing with 365. So dynamic pricing, centralized POS, all of these things. A lot more to come. They're, every quarter that they're learning more and more, they're just retroactively rolling it out to all their 460 stores. Interestingly, too, during the deflation, they stopped expanding as dramatically. They've, they've pulled back the reins on growth in order to basically make sure they're attacking the next thousand stores appropriately. What that does is it actually, it's, it minimizes the downside because the worse the market gets, the more they stop growing, the better the margins actually get. So they can offset most of that price deflation. Uh, it's never been more shorted and recommended as a, as a short. The short interest has really been higher. There's over a billion dollars worth of stock outstanding short. Um, and the key contraindicator, Barron's, thinks it's uh, p potentially junk food. So we like to think about sentiment versus reality, where people are really getting things wrong. And so I think I just showed you the sentiment's fairly bearish on it. We think it's actually, because deflation is now ebbing, uh, we think it's actually a 50-50 type of environment, but over the next six to 12 months, we think that the operating environment significantly improves for Whole Foods and they're able to actually take advantage of, of all of these science projects that they've, that, they've been, um, that they've been working on. So that's basically it in a nutshell, the, the, the skewed to the upside and the qualitative factors. Um, I think it's very timely. Here's the first 10% of our global force rank system. It's, it's the, the second highest rated idea. That we, that we think that we're looking at. And I'd, I'd sort of like to leave you with, um, with a discussion about what John Mackey is sort of pioneering, is this book, Conscious Capitalism. And the essence can basically be, be summarized by Aristotle, um, which is basically success comes from who you are, not any sort of strategy. Um, and, and I love the metaphor that John gives in the beginning of the book, which is we can either be caterpillar, caterpillars and consume as much as we possibly can, take as much from the world as we possibly can. Um, or we can be cross pollinators that try to make that try to that that actually looks for synergies instead of uh, cost cuts essentially, and I, it has significant economic benefits when you become a more conscious business. Um, this is this is a, a selection of 30, 38, I think firms um, that independent studies have shown employees love to work there, cons customers love them, the communities love them. Um, they actually pay. Like, so for instance, uh, who's on this list? Uh, I'm gonna come back to that. Costco pays twice the wages that Walmart does, um, makes more money, pays more taxes, significantly outperforms them. So it's really, when you think about like a lot of these high quality companies that people um, pitch, all, it's like the who's who that is on this list. And, what, and the difference right here in performance, I think uh, Federico Castro here la last year said it best, which is, Compound interest is a very interesting concept, but it, you can have the, it has the same effect when you apply that interest into people. And I think that you can basically say, this is the Federico effect right here, the, the, the 10 and a half X. So, um, oh, secondly, it's very harmonized with this Gallup Strength Finder. So um, this is the second book. If you've not done this, I really, really recommend it. We use it to hire and make sure that everyone is maximizing their strengths. But as, as companies make sure that their employees are totally engaged in optimi optimizing their strengths, everything gets better across the board. Um, and so I don't even have time to talk about the, the nonprofit. We have a nonprofit. We're supporting conscious capitalism, among a couple other things. Um, and I invite you to do two things. Um, if you want to give me your business card, I will set you up with ongoing access to as Whole Foods develops, as we put out notes and things. You'll just get uh, pinged in your inbox. And if you come to New York, I will treat you to New Jersey's, New Jersey's finest Cabernet Franc. And with that, uh, let's go to your questions. Oh, and I managed to end on Chrysler, the, the Chrysler building in the background. So I just thought that was sort of funny. Uh, any, any questions? Retail, disruption. Uh, thank you, great presentation. Um, if I remember correctly, their same store sales have been negative for the last few quarters. Yep. What is the reason for that? Is it just the deflation or is there something else going on? Because the market is worried about competition. Yeah, comps decelerated to like two, negative two, three percent. First time in, uh, since the recession, but then really the recession, the 09, 08 recession was the first time in history of the firm for negative comps. Um, it's the rollout of organic foods everywhere causing deflation. Um, our view is that, that is that's that's totally in the rearview mirror. That's happened, and so they've lost those customers that drove two hours to the store, um, and so that's part of so traffic 
traffic was negative in addition to price. Traffic is now stabilized and now positive again into going into the next quarter. Um, so that's, it's, it's basically the grocery-wide deflation. UK retailers have gone through the same thing, partially caused by Aldi and Lidl. Like I showed you, Aldi's, rolled, Aldi's there. Aldi's almost the biggest. In, in three, four years, Aldi will be the biggest um, grocery store in America. But you guys seen that the process is pretty much over at this point? Say that again, sorry? You guys are seeing that that process is pretty much over at this point as far as these customers leaving? Well, you see it in the government number that deflation's over, so pricing can at least stabilize from here. Um, the color that we get, so we're, we have very close people to their supply chain, um, and also the color that Whole Foods themselves and, and Fresh Market will give you is that, yes, that, that, um, that trade away from them into just the Kroger's is, is, is abating, yes. So the traffic is, is resumed, uh, is getting better. Everyone loves groceries, huh? There's a lot of contrarian buys here, I like it. Any other? Okay, thanks. <laughs>